Hello, everyone. Good evening. And uh, thank you so much for joining us here tonight and taking the time to be here for uh, one of Lizette and I's favorite uh, evenings of the year. Uh, by the way, uh, does very much appreciate the uh, co-host nod. Uh, but truth be told, uh, my incredible wife is the host. And I'm the guy lucky enough to be married to her. So big round of applause to Lizette and the rest of the team that helps put together this incredible event every year. Very, <laughs> very much appreciated. So I want to talk a little bit tonight about uh, why the Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula means so much to us and why we've taken the time to get so involved. And I wanted to do that by sharing a recent experience. As a matter of fact, I didn't know how Des was going to introduce me, but it's related to that moment when we had the opportunity to do a Q&A session uh, with the Youth of the Year semifinalists, the finalists that you saw here tonight, uh, the semifinalists, uh, some alumni, and some members of the staff. And I, I wanted to share it with you um, for really two reasons. On the one hand, uh, I was struck by how familiar the people felt to me and the environment felt to me. But at the same time, I want to talk a little bit about some very significant differences in our life experiences and the implications for those experiences, and how the Boys and Girls Club can help make a difference with regard to those differences. With regard to the familiarity, I guess by now I shouldn't be surprised. I've had the great fortune of being affiliated with this organization for the last eight years, starting as a Youth of the Year judge, uh, introduced to the organization uh, by our dear friend and secret weapon of the Boys and Girls Club, Dana Weintraub. <laughs> Big round of applause. If you know her, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, it was back then that I had my first exposure to uh, some of the most intelligent, passionate, compassionate, dedicated, and resilient young adults I had ever had the pleasure to meet. And you can see it embodied by this year's finalists and some of those speeches, all of those speeches, which by the way, in the eight years I've been doing this, uh, easily rank among the most inspiring I've ever seen. So how about another big round of applause for the incredible Youth of the Year finalists. <clears throat> so th the reason uh, I find my interactions with um, that kind of talent so familiar is it reminds me of the incredible people I get the opportunity to work with every day at LinkedIn. People with similar skill sets, similar abilities, kind of that inner glow, if you will. They just have this it quality. And you want to connect with them. You want to work with them. They inspire you to do better. So that was the familiar part. And by now, I think some of you know exactly what that is. But it was also noteworthy for these very marked differences in our experiences. And I want to exemplify uh, those differences uh, through uh, three brief little stories. One uh, was an anecdote that was shared during the Q&A. Uh, the second is a question I was asked. And the third is a piece of advice I was given. So with regard uh, to the anecdote, uh, when I first got there uh, for the Q&A session, some of the folks were running a little late. So Peter uh, encouraged us to continue to get to know one another while we were waiting. And I asked the, the group uh, how they spent their holiday break. It was just several weeks ago we did this. And uh, one of the semifinalists, one young lady, said that uh, she spent the break uh, getting her first job at Banana Republic. And I said, oh, congratulations. And when you say getting your first job, do you mean getting the job or actually working during the holidays? And she said, both. And I said, but it was a break. It's a vacation. You're supposed to take time off from all of the hard work and the pressure of school and after school. And it's an opportunity to decompress and connect with your friends, experience new things. As soon as I said it, I realized the mistake that I had made. And as if Peter was reading my mind, he said, you know, Jeff, some of these kids need to work to help their parents pay the rent. So that's how we kicked off the session. <laughs> we then went into the Q&A portion of the program. And the very first question I got was from another young lady, a semi-finalist. And she was asking me what advice I would have for an undocumented immigrant who wanted to be successful in terms of the college application process and in college. 
And I get asked a lot of questions during these kind of Q&A sessions that I've done for many years now by virtue of my role. That's the first time I've been asked that question. And I admit it, I am not an expert in those matters with regard to the obstacles that she would face. And I said, I can't necessarily help you on the technicality of being an undocumented immigrant, especially with this extraordinary achievement that she had experienced and uh, what obstacles she would face and how to overcome them. But I, I did pivot to a broader answer, which was the importance of identifying the problems and challenges she would face and then surrounding herself with a support system, a network that could help her overcome those obstacles. The Q&A continued for another hour or so. And uh, once that was completed, I turned the tables on uh, the students a little bit. And I said, now I'd like to ask you a question. So what advice do you have for me? You guys have completely different backgrounds and perspectives. And you guys are on top of your stuff. And I'd like to know what advice or words of wisdom you'd have for someone like myself. And each comment was just as thoughtful as the previous one. We talked about diversity and the importance of diversity in various leadership styles. But it was the last comment uh, that really got my attention. And it was from a, a recent uh, Boys and Girls Club alum who said, Jeff, uh, my advice to you would be to make sure that when hiring, you're not discriminating against people with a police record or who have an arrest on their record because none of us should be judged for the worst thing we ever did. We completed the session and Peter and I sat down. We had some matters we wanted to discuss. And I said to Peter, Peter, do you know what was behind that last comment, the advice that was given to me? And he said, yeah, uh, that individual had just bailed his brother out after having been arrested. As I was driving home uh, from this very memorable experience, I was thinking about what we had talked about. And I was thinking in particular about these three particular experiences and discussions. And it occurred to me that when I was their age and in a similar situation, I worked for the experience. I worked to build out my relationships in my network. I worked to put some extra spending money in my pocket. I didn't work to help my parents pay the rent and can only imagine what that would feel like. And when it came to applying to schools, I focused on my grades and my extracurricular activities, not where I was born or where, where I wasn't born. And when it came to applying for jobs, I never once worried that I would be judged for the worst thing that I ever did. And it began to occur to me the vicious, vicious cycle that takes place for young people experiencing these challenges, despite their extraordinary ability and talent and skills and aptitude. They're not necessarily being given the same chance as other people. And I'll give you an example of this. Before I do, though, I think it's important for all of us to bear in mind. We oftentimes talk about socioeconomic stratification in this country. As Peter mentioned earlier, we talk and spend a lot of time on trying to close a widening opportunity gap. But we very rarely talk about the network gap, the lack of social capital that accrues to individuals who have to deal with these challenges day in and day out. That's the vicious cycle. The opposite of that is the virtuous cycle that takes place when you've gone to the right colleges and you've gotten the right first job and you've been able to build up the right network and relationships. So here's the example. I'll make this a little more interactive. Show of hands, how many people in attendance tonight at any point in your career path have gotten a job or were able to be in a better position to get a job as a result of somebody that you knew? who introduced you to the company, mentioned the opportunity, was willing to put in a good word for you, raise them up high. Okay, it's probably about 90%, 90 plus percent of the people here. At LinkedIn, because this is what we do, we've actually done some analysis and research, and it turns out, we'll put a little data behind this so it's not strictly anecdotal, people that apply for a job on LinkedIn 
when are, they are given a referral by someone they know in their network, are 10 times more likely to get the job than someone that didn't get a referral. 10 times. And that's oftentimes something that we celebrate in our ability to help people who are in that position, to leverage their networks. But what about those that don't have the networks, but have all the potential and all of the ability? What about those people? And that's where the Boys and Girls Club comes in. The Boys and Girls Club, through the extraordinary team that Peter has been able to build, world-class talent that, trust me, would be able to get work up and down Silicon Valley at any of the top companies here. That's how good they are. By virtue of this team and the work that they do for these young adults, these students with so much promise, their ability to help them graduate with a clear plan and understanding of what they want to accomplish, the ability to provide them support systems, networks, mentorship, the ability to make a mistake, and know that there's someone there to pick you up, Introductions for apprenticeships, interns, being there when you go off to school, and Des was talking about this earlier, having that ability to fall back on people who are there for him, even though he's experiencing a lot of new things. And perhaps most importantly, the ability to help these incredibly talented folks get a job, fulfill their potential, and in doing so, help break the vicious cycle and create virtuous cycles by ensuring that talent like the talent you heard from tonight, they get the jobs, they build the networks, they become the hiring managers and the decision makers. They lend their networks to the youth that follows and they become the role models. That's how we break the vicious cycle and create a virtuous cycle. Des introduced me saying I was going to share a few thoughts on why I'm on Team Boys and Girls Club of the Peninsula. And whenever I'm asked that question, whenever I think about what this organization means to Lizette and I and why we get involved, I'm reminded of the wonderfully inspiring words of Mer Merv Morris. Where is Merv? I, I know he's back in this area. And uh, for those that don't know, Merv is one of the all-time great contributors to this organization. He's one of the reasons it is what it is today. And he had a quote as to why he gets as involved as he does. And he said, these are our kids. This is our town. And this is our watch. And if we, all of us here, can support the Boys and Girls Club and turn these vicious cycles into virtuous cycles, this can be our solution as well. Thank you very much.